Today, the president is once again trying to rewrite history, insisting that he tried to stop a crowd in North Carolina that broke out into a chant of send her back as he continued his attacks on four Democratic congresswomen of color. Now the president says he disagreed with it, didn't like it, and tried to shut the crowd down. When your supporters last night were chanting, chanting, send her back, why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you ask them to stop saying that? Well, number one, I, I think I did. I started speaking very quickly. It, it really was a loud, I disagree with it, by the way, but it was quite a chant. And uh, I felt a little bit badly about it. But I will say this, uh, I did, and I started speaking very quickly. But you'll stop them if they try to do it again. Well, I didn't like that they did it, and I started speaking very quickly. I started very quickly. Very quickly. That, of course, is not accurate. Not accurate according to reporters in the stadium at the time, and not accurate according to the tape. Omar has a history of launching vicious anti-Semitic screeds. And she talked about the evil Israel, and it's all about the Benjamins. Not a good thing to say. So we see that, we know that. What is now most interesting about this revisionist history, though, is that it, this isn't the first time Donald Trump has tried this. It is eerily similar to another Trump-inspired chant, Lock Her Up, which you heard over and over again, of course, in the 2016 campaign about Hillary Clinton. Then in July of 2016, Trump said he didn't like that either. When I started talking about Hillary Clinton, the veterans who saw her 24 hours before started screaming, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. And I said, don't do that. Now, I didn't do that for any reason. I really, I didn't like it. And they stopped. But they really didn't stop. That chant is still happening and did as recently as last month. And you notice there that Donald Trump is also not trying to stop the crowd there either. But wait, there is more. Do you remember this classic? Well, if you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Okay? Just knock the hell. I promise you, I will pay for the legal fees. I promise. I promise. So, of course, when a Trump supporter actually did sucker punch a protester at a rally just a month later, the campaign distanced itself immediately from the violence, saying, let me get their words right, obviously they discourage this kind of behavior. Sensing a pattern? Let's get to the White House. Caitlin Collins is there for us. Caitlin, this isn't about the president. If this is about the president, if this isn't about the president truly trying to discourage his supporters from doing anything, you are learning that it is about pressure from behind the scenes. Yeah, Kate, the day after that chant happened there in Greenville, North Carolina, where I was, you saw Republicans coming out, denouncing the chant, but very few of them were condemning the president himself over that, except we are now being told behind the scenes that the White House was essentially getting an earful from some of their allies out here in Washington, telling the president that he needs to disavow himself from this chant, distance himself from it, and that's why you saw the president take that position in the Oval Office yesterday. Some of the people that we know that uh, Vice President Mike Pence got an earful from Republicans talking about uh, what kind of a tough position they were in when reporters were asking them, do you think it's okay for the president's supporters to chant this? And we also were told that the president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, is another voice that he heard from urging him to distance himself from this chant. But interestingly enough, you're seeing the president yesterday in the Oval Office when he's faced one on one with a reporter asking him about this chant. He says he doesn't like it and that he tried uh, to move on quickly so the chant would stop going on, which of course is not true if you watch the video. But then today you see the president now blaming the media, lashing out at them on Twitter, saying that they're the ones responsible for the reaction to that rant. A lot of that has to do with the president who doesn't like one on one confrontation. And that's why you're see seeing him really change his tune here. Caitlin, this also isn't the first time that we've heard about Ivanka Trump stepping in behind the scenes to try to moderate her father, but we really haven't heard yeah. about that in a while. 
Yeah, it's kind of a running joke in Washington that every time something controversial happens or something the president does, Ivanka Trump or one of his close family members steps in, advises him to change his mind, to take a different route. That was something that was a big storyline at the beginning of the administration with Ivanka Trump. And you kind of saw it change after the Paris Climate Accords when, you know, she was a voice who made pretty public that she wanted her father not to withdraw from that. And then he disregarded her advice and did so anyway. And after that, you stopped seeing those stories as much, talking about her involvement and what she advises her father to do. But this time around, it is something that ramped back up. Yeah. Kaylin, great to see you. Thank you so much.